Okay, comrades. Okay. Hello. We will begin this meeting now. Welcome to session four of Marxism, day four. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed the weekend, if you've been here the whole time, or if you just come today. Um, my name is Jandre. Um, I'm a member of the SWP in Newham. Um, I also do the social media for Socialist Worker Newspaper and have been doing so for Marxism Festival as well. Um, so I'll be your chair for today. Uh, just to explain how the meetings run, though I'm sure you all know, uh, the speaker will come in and speak for about 30 minutes. Throughout the meeting, uh, team members in the pink shirts will be waving around uh, white slips, speaker slips. So if you would like to make a contribution, please indicate to them and they'll pass you the sheet and then give it back to them when you're finished. And then I'll be able to call in names um, uh, when the discussion begins. Um, uh, so, I'll, so when I open the floor to discussion, you'll have about three minutes to contribute. I'll let you know when you have one minute left. Um, but I'll explain that when the time comes. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Charlie Kimber, who is the editor of the Socialist Worker newspaper, and, um, and he will be speaking on Corbyn to Melicon, Can Left Reformism Bring Change? Over to you. Uh, well, thank you, jean Dre. As someone who sits three meters from you normally, that's uh, over the continuing that, I suppose. Um, Look, I think the whole of Marxism has been about seeking a set of politics that can win real change in society. Uh, not simply adopting slogans, not being a sect, not separating ourselves off from where the real struggle is, but looking at ways in which we can real, achieve real change. That's the, that's the challenge for all of us. It's an urgent question, isn't it? It's not an indefinite question. The scale of climate chaos, of poverty, of racism, of war, of the threat of nuclear war, all of that means that we have to have a seriousness about how we achieve change in society. And what I want to look at is the experiments that there have been amongst people to the left of the normal social democratic parties, the Labour style parties. I mean, one of them is Corbyn, who clearly was a Labour Party member. But one of the things I argued in 2015, and I think it was right, is that Corbyn campaigned for the Labour Party leadership as if he was a member of a different party to that of the Labour Party. And actually it was part of his attraction that he seemed to be part of a wave that had swept across Europe in particular, but the United States of America as well, in reaction to the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, 2009, which produced, because of the bitterness against the system, the bailing out of the rich, the struggles that took place as people fought against austerity, a backlash against the traditional uh, forms of organization. So, you see in uh, Greece, the emergence of Syriza. You see uh, in Spain, the Spanish state, the emergence of Podemos. You see uh, in America, eventually, the Bernie Sanders uh, campaigns within the Democratic Party. Uh, in Britain, you see the election of Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, in Ireland, you see the growth of people before profit. You see the way in which People are looking to the left of the traditional social democratic parties. And Corbyn, I think, was part of that way. And it matters in Britain because at the next general election, uh, we are going to see, probably, or, well, almost certainly, uh, Jeremy Corbyn stands against an official Labour Party candidate in Islington North. And we will call for a vote for Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, we haven't discussed that as a party yet, but I'm telling you now we will. Um, uh, because I have, and I say that not because I'm, you know, a tyrant who stamps upon democracy inside the organisation, because I haven't met anybody in the party yet who doesn't think we should call for a, a vote for Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, potentially for Diane Abbott, uh, if she stands, and uh, Sandy Nicholl was kind enough to show me before I came in here, because you can get caught up in the Marxism bubble and not notice anything except I watch France and almost nothing else at the moment, uh, that 
Sir John McDonnell has said that he is going to vote against the Labour Whip over the question of the boycott, divestment and sanctions. Yeah, good, eventually. But anyway, that, you know, let's, not, let's not get too carried away. But anyway, uh, but, but if, he, if he does do that, uh, it's quite possible that someone will say this shows that he's anti-Semitic. Um, and therefore he must be expelled from the Labour Party. Uh, and I very much doubt if Keir Starmer is going to say, no, 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 that's entirely a reason. John's a jolly good chap and we mustn't uh, expel him. And therefore the possibility of three people on the left of the Labour Party, uh, not voluntarily, it has to be said, uh, leveraged out by the very right-wing uh, forces of Keir Starmer and his mates, uh, will be standing. Now, if those three do stand, uh, we will call for a vote for all of them. Again, we need to discuss this in the party. I'm telling you what I think, though. All right? uh, I, I think we will call for a vote for all of them. What we won't do is to say, if only uh, there were people like Jeremy Corbyn or John McDonnell or Diane Abbott everywhere, this would solve the question of socialist politics. And the reason I say that, well, it's twofold. Number one, they won't do it as we're forming a new organisation. They will do it as a series of individuals. And much of what they say will be is, vote for us, and then we can get back into the Labour Party. And you think about the, example in, the best example in Britain is Ken Livingstone, of course. Ken Livingstone, who uh, stood to be Mayor of London as the Labour Party candidate. He was blocked wholly undemocratically from being the Labour Party candidate. He stood as an independent and he won. Um, Ken Livingston had a left veneer. He wasn't that very left wing in truth, but nonetheless he was too left wing for the Blairites. And he won as Mayor of London. What did he do with it? The most important thing for him was that he then managed to get back into the Labour Party. Tony Blair led him back into the Labour Party and allowed him, and he then stood again and won in the Mayor of London, and then of course was expelled effectively from the Labour Party again for made up stuff about anti-Semitism. That will be Corbyn, Abbott and Madoff, that will be the major thing that will be on their minds. That's the first weakness in the case, right? The second weakness is this, and that's why we need to look at the examples about which I'm going to speak. Even if they set up an organisation which was different to that of the Labour Party, if it is ideologically and politically based on the same ideas as the Labour Party, it will fail. It will fail. And that's why I want to look at the examples very quickly. And I, I hope it's more than just, here's a list of 50 betrayals by reformists. Which, you know, I can do 500 betrayals by reformists if you want. And I hope it's more than that. Because I want very quickly to look at why these things happen. Why is it that they end up not as fulfilling the hopes that people have in them, but dashing the hopes that people have in them. And what, what we can learn from that experience. You see, in every case, do we welcome the break from the, social, the traditional social democrats? Absolutely 100%. Absolutely 100%. We welcome the fact that there is a discussion about socialist politics and there is a discussion which sees people saying that the presently existing social democratic parties are not delivering for working class people. Number two, can it raise the confidence of people to fight? Yes, it can actually. Corbyn's election in 2015 raised the sights of the whole of the left. No doubt at all about that. It made it much easier to talk about socialism. Because he was talking about socialism, it was easier for us to talk about socialism. It enthused quite large layers of ordinary working class people, particularly young people, 
to think that they wanted to get involved in politics. She is very clear in the United States of America over Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders' campaigns, Bernie Sanders is not particularly left-wing, and was running to be a candidate for an openly capitalist party, the Democrats, nonetheless led to a very big interest in the ideas of socialism. This, this, is, this is important. But you then have to look at the record of what happens when these people get into office or get close to office. And here I think we need to think about the contradictions as well, the contradictions of Corbynism, for example. Corbynism both ensused people, got people talking about socialism, but it also trapped people. It trapped people within the idea that the way you got change was to become a member of the Labour Party and was to vote Jeremy Corbyn into Parliament. And it actually led to a move away from the idea of organising demonstrations or seeing strikes as the way to achieve change. And we have to recognise that it also had that effect, particularly after the success Corbyn had in 2017. The closer Corbyn came, towards seeing that he was likely to get into 10 Downing Street, the more he moved away from an attention upon resistance on the streets and the workplaces as a way in which to get change in society. Okay, a quick run through so that people are familiar with the ground upon which we're talking. Think about Syriza. I know Syriza isn't in the title, but it would really be silly not to talk about Syriza, given that we've just gone through the elections in Greece, which represent really the closing of the page on the Syriza experiment. The fact that Alexis Tsipras has resigned as leader of Syriza is in a sense drawing a line about what has happened. Now, it's inconceivable that Syriza would have been elected in 2015 without working class resistance. You cannot separate the rise of Syriza from the 32 general strikes, or 27 general strikes, depending who you've talked to, but anyway, a very large number of general strikes, the great student movements, the great movements against racism that took place in Greece. And Syriza was lifted by that movement. You don't just uh, believe me about it. Look at the election figures. 2007, before the great financial crisis, Syriza 5%. 2009, as the crisis hits, 4.6% of the vote. May of 2012, 16.8% of the vote. June of 2012, 27% of the vote. In other words, the crisis and the reaction to the crisis lifts Syriza to the edge of office. And, you know, I know we've talked about this in other meetings, when Syriza was elected in 2015, it was the hope of Europe. Everywhere people thought, at last, a party has got elected which is going to contest the boot on the neck of the European Union, the European Central Bank, the IMF, the Troika, which is going for Portugal, which is going for Ireland, which is going for Greece, which is going for the Spanish state. Here at last, is someone who is going to stand up against it. And you know the history, I don't want to go through the horrible history of it. Right from the start, Syriza thought the only way in which we are going to achieve change is through negotiation with the powers in Europe and internationally. And they went to them and put forward, Yanis Varoufakis, who was good enough to speak yesterday at this event, went to them and tried to persuade them that it was foolish of them to keep going with the austerity measures. It would be much better for them if they lifted austerity and came to an agreement with the Syriza government. And on one level, Varoufakis was absolutely right. <laughs> it's an incredible fact that today the Greek debt is greater than it was when the austerity measures began. Greater! <coughs> All the austerity, all the horrible suffering that people went through, the illness, the malnutrition, the deaths of ordinary people that happened because of the vicious austerity they imposed has not reduced the debt at all. In fact, the debt is greater. But it was never really about the money. 
It was about the demonstration effect. You can vote for who you like, it will make no difference. We're still going to impose the austerity regime. And then Syriza went to the Greek population and said, do you accept the austerity package or not? The Greek population in the famous Ochi referendum, the no referendum, people voting, no, we don't want it. And the result, Syriza collapsed and implemented a worse austerity package than its conservative predecessor. And not just in economic matters, it also set up detention camps for migrants, a vicious regime against them, and attacked protesters, tear gassing pensioners and others in Syntagma Square who fought back against the austerity regime. Now, you know, that it's a lot, it's away from 2015 to 2023, but the basis of Syriza's concessions happened in the first few weeks when it was in office. That's the truth about what happened to Syriza. If you look at uh, Podemos, part of that same way, this time in the Spanish state, Podemos is inconceivable without the great revolts there were during the time of the crisis, the 15M movement that filled the squares in Barcelona, in Madrid, in so many other places as well, fighting back. And Podemos was an expression, or a partial expression at least, of that movement. And again, it was extremely exciting. The idea that it was possible to resist in a very different way to that of the traditional Social Democrats, Pechoy, the very badly misnamed Socialist Workers' Party in Spain, uh, no relation uh, to us with the equivalent of the Labour Party. Uh, no, 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 we're breaking from that. We're breaking from that, and instead we want a different sort of organisation. And Podemos was incredibly successful, very, very quickly. <laughs> Not to, no, it wasn't the same as Syriza. Podemos claimed to be right from the start, neither left nor right. It was a party that, mo that was uh, based upon the ideas of Le Clau and Mouffe, for those who want to know its ideological uh, basis. The idea that it would mobilise the people the people as a whole against the caster, the caste at the top of society. I can remember hearing one of the leading figures of uh, Podemos who spoke in London quite soon after its formation, who was asked, what, what do you do about the question of the Spanish Civil War, for example? What do you say about Franco? And they said, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about it because we don't want to divide people between left and right around that question. Uh, very, very clear about what its politics was, but it seemed to be an exciting development. And it was successful, and in its original phase, it refused, for example, to enter coalition with the Social Democrats. It did well in the elections. The Social Democrats, Pechoy, said to them, will you come into coalition with us? And they said, no, we won't do that. But then Podemos decided we have to attempt to enter into government, and therefore we must leave behind our original roots. There's a, a very telling quotation from Pablo Iglesias, who was the leader uh, of Podemos, who put it like this in 2016. The idiocy that we used to say when we were on the extreme left, that things change in the street and not the institutions, is a lie. And that became the hallmark of Podemos, which said, we're leaving behind the organization in the streets, we are going to have to do it in institutions. Which led eventually to Podemos becoming uh, a coalition with the equivalent of the Labour Party, and then implementing austerity, support for the war in Ukraine, support for NATO, and all the racist crimes of the Spanish state in North Africa, and also against refugees. And the end result is that Podemos, in the same way that Syriza has collapsed electorally, Podemos also has collapsed electorally. This is, this is a reality about it. And if I think about Mélenchon in France, of course Mélenchon has not entered office in the same way. 
But the hallmark is the same. I mean, Mélenchon was, again, a split from the Socialist Party. Uh, Mélenchon was uh, a Socialist Party member for a very long time. He was a senator uh, for the Socialist Party. He was twice a minister in a Socialist Party government. He was someone who is an admirer of the Mitterrand's uh, government that was elected in 1981, even after the austerity term that it made in 1983, very much someone who came from that establishment, eventually broke from the Socialist Party at again around this time of the resist of the revolt. And since then, undeniably, he has put forward a position which has electrified quite large numbers of people in France. There's no doubt at all about that. Um, in the 2017 election, presidential election, he came fourth, but was very, very close to going through into the second round of the elections. Um, which, if he had done, would have meant that uh, Marine Le Pen, the fascists, would not have been in the second round of the elections. And in 2022, the most recent ones, he was even closer. He got nearly 8 million votes as president. Very, very important uh, scale of the vote in France. Nonetheless, if you look at what Mélenchon has done, he's given a focus for that sense of resistance. At the same time, he has funneled it towards a parliamentary form rather than putting people on the streets. And what he has done is to shape it in a particular way which directs people away from resistance in the streets and the workplaces and says to people, the crucial thing is to vote for me in Parliament. So, I said he got 8 million votes. He did not mobilise 8 million people against Marine Le Pen in the second round of the parliamentary elections. He didn't say to his voters... Uh, during the most recent wave, uh, everyone should be on strike. Of course he supported the strikes. Of course he did. Of course he called for the demonstrations to be supported, the trade union demonstrations. But he also said that the key thing really was to make sure that you voted the right way. That the prime, this is the crucial question, what is the primacy? We can do two things. We can do elections we can mobilise in the streets. But which of them disciplines the other? That's the key question. And for Mélenchon, for Tsipras, for Iglesias, whatever the uncertainties at the beginning, when it came to it, the crucial thing was that the parliamentary edge was blunted, was overcoming the edge of resistance in the streets and the workplaces. The Parliament always comes first. Even though they were a break from the social democracy, they were a reformed sort of social democracy, not a different form of party altogether. This, this for me, is the crucial question. If you think about Corbyn, it's even clearer. Corbyn, of course, was not organisationally a break. Corbyn, Corbyn remains inside the Labour Party, becomes, in truth, almost as an accident, manages to become a candidate for the leader in 2015. I'm sure, you know, well, we know that there are many Labour MPs who signed his form to be able to be a candidate, who bitterly regretted it afterwards. They thought, oh, well, this will look good if he's allowed to be a candidate, and he'll be smashed, and that will show that we're a broad church and all the rest of it. And it ended up, of course, with loads of people voting for Corbyn because they wanted to see a change, rather than the drab candidates that, they were, that he was up against. Corbyn, as I say, was undoubtedly a lift to the movement. And it energised and gave people a new voice. But the problem was, he made concessions and compromises from the start. I mean, how can you explain why Jeremy Corbyn, a man who I've spoken with on a whole number of occasions, and was very pleased to do so, a man who, if he stands for anything, stands for the removal of nuclear weapons, for example, twice stood at a general election on a platform of the refurbishment of the Trident nuclear deterrent. How can you explain it? Only because that's what the Labour Party does to you. 
because if you're to keep the right wing on board, if you're to keep the right wing trade union leaders of the GMB and Unite who wrongly think that the, the defence of jobs must come before blowing up the entirety of humanity, uh, and even though many more jobs could be created by removing the money from nuclear weapons towards something that's socially useful, in order to keep them all on board, you, can, you make concessions around those sorts of things. Why did Corbyn call for 20,000 extra cops? Corbyn doesn't believe that the police are the solution to anything. He spent his whole life campaigning about people who've been beaten up by the cops or, sh or killed by the cops or have been deported by the cops. He knows the reality of the situation. That's what the Labour Party does to you. And as I say, particularly after 2017, he moved further and further away from any reliance on this question of the movement from the streets and the workplaces and more and more into Parliament. And the result of that is therefore a blunting of any radicalism inside it. You see, one of the extraordinary things is, you look at Starmer, Starmer is completely ruthless against his enemies. Completely ruthless. I mean, he's already crushed them. Doesn't stop him still going for them, though. You've signed, 11 of you, have signed a statement to stop the war saying that you're against the war in Ukraine and that you don't trust NATO. If you don't take your name off it, you will be expelled. All of them collapsed. All of them collapsed within an hour. Actually led by John McDonnell, the person who, quite rightly, I suppose, people uh, clapped. But nonetheless, let's be clear, it was John McDonnell who led that retreat uh, to take their names off, within an hour of Starmer saying it. Corbyn, the man that had been the Prime Minister candidate in 2019, removed, removed, not allowed to be a Labour MP. Now, Corbyn didn't do anything like that. Not a single right winger was deselected. Not one under Corbyn's rule. There were concessions to them. Compromise it. That's what the Labour Party does to you. And now look, how do we understand this? It can't just be about the personality of Alexis Tsipras or Jean-Luc Mélenchon or Pablo Iglesias or Jeremy Corbyn. It must be about systematic questions. It must be about the way in which society works and the way in which social democratic reformist parties work. Reformist parties believe that you can achieve fundamental change within the system as it presently exists. And the biggest problem for that is that essentially power does not lie in Parliament. Elections do matter, of course they do. That's a couple of comrades from Ireland here, and I hope they'll speak about it. I think that what comrades have done in Parliament has been extremely important, and what people before profit and the Socialist Worker Network has done is extremely important, and we can learn from uh, their experiences. But the reality is power does not lie in Parliament. There's so much of society which is not open to democracy at all that, above all else, the economic levers of society are not open to democracy. Nobody gets a vote on investment decisions or what's produced or to whom it's distributed or how it's produced or the environmental consequences of that production. It's not open. And if you upset the bankers and the bosses, they will turn on you. I mean, we've sort of an incredible example recently, haven't we, in Britain? Liz Truss survived 49 days as Prime Minister. And Liz Truss was a Conservative, by the way, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> Liz Truss upset the bankers and the bosses. Let's not go into all the detail, well, but they were upset by Kwasi Kwarteng's budget and, and what Trust was saying. What did the bosses and bankers do? They didn't write a strongly worded letter to the Times or get up a petition. They destroyed the government. They destroyed it. They ramped up the interest rate. They had a huge run on the currency. They almost destroyed the British pensions industry as a as collateral damage while they were doing this, by the way. And they destroyed the government. 
and trust was rejected. It was, a, it, was a, it was essentially a financial coup. That may sound over the top. But truth is, they left Kwarteng and trust were tossed out. Now, of course, there wasn't much democracy involved in the first place in them being elected. None of that general election nonsense. But nonetheless, they were, they were removed. And that's what they did to a Tory. To a Tory. Can you imagine what they would have done if Jeremy Corbyn had been elected? The scale of the financial firestorm would have been far, far greater. And that's why, at the same time as we will say, vote for Corbyn in Islington North, vote for Abbott in Hackney North, they think actually it's being uh, redefined, it'll be a different constituency, but anyway, Hackney somewhere, uh, and McDonnell in Hayes and Harlington in West London, uh, vote for them, we will do it as an independent revolutionary detachment, by which I mean that we are not going to pretend to people that we need a Labour Party Mark II. And we are not going to pretend to people that if only we had a break like Syriza or Pedemos or La France and St. Mies or any of these sorts of experiments that it would solve this question of socialist politics. Because we have to draw a line between those sorts of ideas of how you achieve change in society and our version which seeks to work with large numbers of people, which seeks to campaign in action along large numbers of people, but crucially says that the way society organised requires, above all else, an offensive and a confrontation with the citadels of economic power, which do not lie in Parliament, but lie in the boardrooms and the banks, and that therefore the key question is the organisation at the base of society, the question of, org of organisation in the streets and the workplaces. And that is a fundamental question. It means that we can work with large numbers of people. We can consider who we vote for in a large number of cases, but this is not going to bring about the sort of transformation that we need which requires revolutionary organisation. Thank you. Okay, first of all, uh, just the speaker slips will be continuing throughout the discussion, so if you'd like to make a contribution, just indicate to the a member in the pink shirt, uh, and then hand uh, the contribution to them. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to call in Richard Boyd Barrett, and at, following Richard Boyd Barrett will be Kim Sanders. So if you just indicate to a member in the pink shirt, they'll pass you a mic. Richard. Yeah, uh, well, just to very strongly, from the Irish perspective, agree with everything Charlie has uh, said. Uh, I mean, we've seen this in Spain. Now, we, we have people in Parliament, I'm in Parliament, but uh, the it, after 2008 and the crash, there was a huge surge to the left, uh, which saw the Labour Party, who historically very weak, had never been a majority party, get a huge surge of support. Uh, they were promising the sun, moon and the stars in terms of opposition to austerity. They went into coalition because they didn't believe in actual resistance, uh, no focus on struggle, uh, and ended up with the right imposing the most savage austerity uh, program imaginable. And they went from 30 something or other percent, which in Irish terms was a lot for a Labour Party, the biggest vote the left had ever got, Today, there's a poll out, 2%. 2%. We're 4%. <laughs> right. So we're now twice as big in the polls, but 4% small too, so don't get carried away, right? But the next iteration of this is Sinn Féin. Uh, and Sinn Féin, of course, they're a Republican Nationalist Party, but they're seen as revolutionary and anti-establishment, and if you like, their rhetoric has been, by and large, a radical left sort of program of we're going to really stick it to the establishment uh, in Ireland. But as they get closer to power, everything Charlie is saying, so it's not even, you know, when they get in, it's happening now, uh, that they are critically, where we're trying to mobilise movements on the housing crisis, which is extremely severe, on the cost of living, uh, against the far right with uh, uh, demonstrations in every single movement we're trying to mobilise, they're holding it back. They're holding it back. 
uh, and demobilizing and conspiring with the trade union leaders to hold it back and saying, no, just wait for the election to elect Sinn Féin. We'll sort everything out. And it's a disaster. And ultimately, it is not only going to mean that they are preparing as they are, I mean, you've seen sickening instances of it where they come over to the flipping coronation of King Charles. It's just unbelievable uh, that they well, they roll out the red carpet for Joe Biden when he comes to uh, Dublin. I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up. Uh, but actually, as they do this and demobilize, it may w well mean they won't even get where they think they're going to go. Because they're demoralizing people, and the thing that has actually, uh, if you like, created the shift to the left has been struggle over things like the enormous fight on water charges, the anger over the housing crisis, and protests that we have sort of pushed out there onto the streets, but they actually see that as a danger. In fact, I think they're so obsessed now with trying to keep things back because they're also afraid we might gain out of it. So the height of their ambition is to watch their left flank and just and even try and eliminate their left flank so they can prepare to get into government uh, with the right. So putting your eggs in the parliamentary basket rather than on the streets and in the workplaces in struggle is a road to disaster and what we need is a revolutionary organisation that sees struggle. Uh, an ounce of struggle is worth a ton of votes. That has to be central to our understanding of how you change the world. Thank you. Following Richard will be Kim. Um, Kim's just over there. And after Kim, uh, it will be Dodo. Please indicate um, if you're the next speaker. Um, just a reminder, contributions keep about three minutes. I will tap the mic when you have one minute left. Thank you. Hi. Um, I, I actually suggested to Jeremy Corbyn, and it didn't seem terribly well taken at the time, that um, what would happen if, if uh, he and a couple of other people on the far left of the, of the Labour Party were to join the Greens. Now, people have been told that the Greens are anti-union. That's not true. And people don't understand that the Green Party is completely bottom-led. In other words, when we go to conference, everything is voted for by the people who are Green Party members. So it's not like somebody gets into government and says, oh, we'll change what we're, you know, what we're going to run for. We'll, we'll change the agenda that we're going to run for. The agenda that we run for is the, ge the agenda that has been organized between all of the members. And yes, that is anti, uh, is, is getting the, the nuclear weapons out of, out of Scotland. That's just, just taking them out altogether. That's just one of many. It's not just an environmental group. It's not a fringe environmental group. It has a complete agenda of social programs. And right now, we're the only social, real, true socialist party left. And instead of reinventing the wheel and coming up with new parties, small parties, people can actually, um, you know, align with the Greens so that they 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 can run as uh, uh, something and green, you know, as independent and green or as whatever and green. So it's it it doesn't lock them out. If we if we had a bunch of those left-wing members come over to the Green Party, it would scare the shit out of Starmer and it would scare the shit out of the Tories too because they could see a landslide in that direction. Thank you. Following Kim will be Dodo uh, and after Dodo is Liam Winnick. Hello, nice to meet you all. My name is Dodo. As, uh, as was suggested, that's correct. Um, um, yeah, I'd just like to argue against um, some of the points made about where power lies. Um, and maybe it's not a popular view, but um, I think there's many reasons to suggest that actually power does lie in the literature and not on the streets. Um, let's start with the Iraq war, two million people on the streets, but control of the military wasn't on the streets. Um, the power of the pen can still change the world. Legislation can still be passed that fundamentally shifts how a democracy works, how we organize. Power can still be taken from corporations through policy. Nationalization can still happen through policy 
rent controls, wealth taxes can all happen through policy. Why would we exit the electoral space just when the material conditions of the world are deteriorating, when we have a cost of living crisis? Now, just because the conditions for revolutionary politics are on the rise, that also means the opportunity for electoral politics is on the rise. It does not necessarily have to be a choice, but why would you exit a sphere that the establishment most, most fears? And we know they fear that sphere because that's what happened when Corbyn ran. That's, that's what they did to stop him. The establishment embarrassed themselves. They had, to, they had to smear him and they had to shut down democracy within the Labour Party. That's part of the reason why the Corbyn project failed. It never realised its potential because it never became a grassroots movement attached to a political project. It was always controlled from above. There was no open selection. Policy making never existed within the party in a way that was meaningful. So it's not, it cannot be used as an example of electoral politics failing because it never became what it should have been. And my final point would be this. That I think if we could do anything, it's not necessarily defending Corbyn, but it's attacking Starmer. I would love to see uh, a proper organisation in Holborn and St Pancras in London, all along those streets, door knocking, telling the residents that actually Corbyn has lied to them, I mean Starmer has lied to them, that he, that Starmer has lied to them, that he is vulnerable because he has had to lie and because people now know who he is and what the Labour Party is. Let's take away his power and let's inspire us all to take the state and get Use the power of the pen to change the world. Our next contribution will be Leah Winnick. Um, uh, following Leah Winnick will be uh, Ray Hat. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, thank you everyone. And I want to come back on the last two points because I think they, they draw up some, some conclusions which are not quite correct around the nature of the state. Um, I think, uh, when, uh, as revolutionary, revolutionary socialists, we believe that you know when workers are compelled to revolt as they are in the capitalist system, the working class cries out for an understand, a proper understanding of the state and the capitalist system that it holds up. And I would like to uh, you know say that, that, that simply uh, that the the state doesn't simply act as a neutral body acting over the, uh, the capitalist system. The, the, nature, the, the nature of the state within the capitalist system and within all class societies is to act as a committee of the organization for the whole of the, the ruling class, that being, you know, in this society, the, the, the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class. And uh, I, I'd like to say that sim simply, you know, capturing control of the state and, and, and saying, oh no, don't worry, we're the good guys now. Stop, uh, you know, stop being on the street, stop protesting, stop, uh, stop going on strike and whatever to disastrous consequences. Uh, 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 just, I think it was yesterday, uh, uh, whilst uh, 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 Corbyn was speaking uh, in the culture tent, inside there was a meeting going on on, on uh, the uh, 50 years since the coup in Chile, and people drew out uh, some, some very interesting similarities between Corbyn and uh, Salvador Allende. Salvador Allende being someone who uh, 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 took a control of the state uh, uh, with a you know coalition of parties and so on, and and, and and in taking control of the state, let's not get it wrong, he did institute some important reform when reforms when you know the the, the cake was very big in in terms of you know the, the, there was massive growth with in, in in the price of copper and so on, and you know the, a, a slice could be taken out and given to the workers, but just 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 when then there was crisis starting to happen, and then workers started fighting for themselves, organising themselves in the Cordones. Uh, so the, the industrial belts, uh, and, and there started to be, uh, you know, pitch battles and, and battles between the working class and the ruling class, the generals, the armies, and so on. Uh, uh, the, 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 what, what did Salvador Allende do? Did he uh, tell the workers to carry on what they're doing and, and, and keep the fight for their conditions against? against the, the, the ruling classes and, 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 and you know, the, the, who were mobilizing for the fascists and, 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 and right-wing forces. No, he told them to go back to work. He told them to stop organizing the, the industrial belts. And what happened? What happened in Chile? Hundreds of people, hundreds, uh, uh, tens of thousands of people killed, tortured, and and uh, and, it, and is what is what you see in in an example of uh, it's either socialism or barbarism. That what happened in Chile was complete barbarism. And I'd like to say that that, that should be the lesson for, uh, for 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 saying that we can't just simply take control of the state and try and mould it to our means. We have to break, and uh, and in doing that, we we have to also uh, within the working class break the hold of reformism within the working class and engage.
engage wider sections of the working class to revolutionary politics and organize to fight and take, uh, 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 and, and take back control of the means of production and take back control of, 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 of the power from the ruling class. Thank you. So before I bring Rehan in, I have a question to read out. So in the less than likely event that Corbyn, Abbott, McDonald did form a new uh, organization, for example, the Peace and Justice Project, uh, would we participate in it? Thank you. Uh, uh, now I'll bring in Rayhad, follow, uh, followed by Rayhad will be uh, Mariette uh, Lobo. Hi, yes, I'm from South Africa, been back uh, over 30 years ago, uh, 30 years now. We had a, now I'm banning in the early 90s, the launch of the South African Communist Party, a very impressive rally, over 90,000 people attended. And within a few years, uh, the, the party was in uh, you know, 200,000 strong. And it remained, according to them, at that sort of level. Have they once uh, mobilized independently to, to take on or to put into action their critique of the turn to, to neoliberalism? No. Um, what we did see then is the emergence of the Economic Freedom Front, uh, a really left nationalist, uh, claimed socialist organization that have really have been, it's not all bad, I mean, they're very important when it comes to mobilizing against xenophobia and so on, but have they ever uh, taken on any of the economic struggles, any of the uh, getting behind any of the strike movements that have emerged over the last uh, decade or so? No. The one uh, organization that we had hope in was the uh, emergence of the Workers' Party following the split of the largest trade union from the, the largest trade union federation. Um, it spent, and, and Charlie was uh, came over during this period and warned us of the prospect and the unwilling, you know, what should be our unwillingness to join hands with the South African Communist Party Mark II. And that's what exactly it, 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 it became. And it took a long time to launch because it spent as much time trying to keep out the likes of the independent left than it did uh, trying to encourage other people. And the experience of our own group was that some of our uh, members went into that group, um, but they realised it was so controlled from above that there wasn't any space for political debate in the structures whatsoever. That the, the, the agenda for branch meetings was sent from the national office and uh, debate really wasn't tolerated. So, I mean, the, what I'd like to ask uh, Charlie, is what has been the experience of our comrades in, in those countries where Spain, uh, you know, Greece, and so on? I mean, in a number of instances, I don't know, certainly in, in Germany with the Linker, uh, we've so joined, and I think we're still there. And I know it's creating problems. Uh, and how, how, you know, how would you sum up that experience if I know there's unique features and all of that, but uh, you know, we historically have said, you know, the problem with these organisations, whether left reformist or, or orthodox reformists, these organisations change us, we don't change them. Thank you. So now we're going to have Mariette, uh, uh, followed by uh, Talai, Tal Tal Abed. Thank you. Uh, Mariette Lobo from Norway. Uh, I am um, in the Central Committee of the Red Party in Norway, that is the Left Socialist Party in Norway. 
uh, and I'm chosen in on an open, uh, I mean openly chosen in on a platform uh, of the international socialist tendency uh, which I belong to. Uh, and I believe it's important to have this uh, uh, alternative to the left of the Social Democracy Party in Norway that uh, promotes, uh, uh, I mean, defends the welfare and uh, promotes um, uh, policies against soaring uh, uh, electricity prices and so on, that there is an alternative for people uh, to vote for. Uh, the discussion I have in the party is uh, comes uh, to uh, mo building movements because the Red Party uh, supports uh, uh, labor actions, I mean uh, uh, working class actions uh, when it comes to strikes or other kinds of uh, um, activities in the um, working places. Uh, but um, my argument is that the party is not active in building uh, support for uh, refugees, uh, for uh, climate change, uh, and not least building the anti-war movement where I am active. Uh, and I think it's important for us, uh, I'm a revolutionary, to remind ourselves that you both need, uh, you need uh, um, groups or parties that build a revolutionary ideas and you need the movement. It's not one or the other, you need both. Uh, you need revolutionary groups or parties that uh, um, connect issues and that argue about what revolution is and, and uh, why a revolution is, is uh, necessary to change uh, the world that you can achieve more than just small uh, um, what we call small uh, um, oh, suddenly the Norwegian word is in my head <laughs> small reforms yeah, that are important in people's lives isn't it? it's important to fight against electricity prices but it's not enough and you can gain much more but it is important to build the activity of uh, the working class and of young people that the Red Party is really attracting uh, we've grown from 2,000 to 14,000 in just a few years and the most of the new members are young people that were not activating in the movement uh, that's a tragedy we could have with 14,000 members you could build a strong climate movement a strong anti-war movement a strong movement for refugees and, and I, f I find it frustrating because it's disciplining the young people it's Some saying that you have to use your activism uh, um, it says that the party is the movement and that's my biggest argument, that the party is not the movement. The party is a party and you also need a movement. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I'm Talat Ahmed. I live in Edinburgh and in Scotland, the Scottish Greens, um, in the last decade or so, have had a spectacular rise, um, partly as a result of um, their anti-war start, uh, partly as a result of their campaign for Scottish independence. And I remember, following the independence referendum in 2012, their membership in Scotland, when they held a conference the year after that, um, rose to 8,000, you know, which Scotland is a very small country, was very significant. Absolutely fantastic. But there is a problem here, and that is that large numbers of those 8,000 members, their principal activity after that has been directed towards parliamentarism, has been directed towards electoralism. The Scottish Green Party, um, you know, they talk in terms of um, wanting to shift um, um, sort of poverty and shift power in, our, in society and they talk about raising a wealth tax but the wealth tax that they talk about is 1%. Now 1% in the world that we live in today with the cost of living crisis is absolutely minimal in comparison to what is required in terms of what we are up against um, in terms of uh, the cost of living crisis and what's happening to our lives. My partner lives in Brighton. You know, the, the, the Green Party in the UK, Caroline Lucas, who is the MP, everybody quite rightly praised her for being very brave, being very heroic. What has the Green Party done in Scotland, in the, sorry, in, the, um, in England, and particularly in Brighton, which was the Greenest Council? They have presided over cuts and we saw strikes of bin workers, which the Green Council did not support. In addition to that, we have, we obviously have refugee crisis all over the country. One of the sharpest elements of this began in Brighton this year, in January, when some 130 odd asylum-seeking children went missing under the Green Council's watch. Oh, and you just have a situation where they're denying responsibility. On top of that, 
the Green Party in Britain now supports NATO. It's removed its opposition to NATO because it talks about NATO now being a defensive organization. Why? Because people are on the defensive over the question of Ukraine and the war and imperialism. I think it's a terrible shame that the Green Party have taken that stance, but the fact that they have, I think, should lead us to ask questions about the particular nature of their strategy, which is predicated upon electoralism, and that cannot be the way forward for revolutionary socialists. Apologies, that will be our last contribution of the evening. Uh, but thank you so much for the discussion. Uh, before I bring Charlie back in to uh, round up, uh, I have a few announcements. So this is the second to last uh, session. So please don't miss the closing rally. It's going to be absolutely brilliant. We had a, we're going to have Richard Boyd Barrett on it. Of the, of, the, of the panel, we're going to have Yeki Tano, a Ghanaian socialist on the panel, and, and many more, including French uh, socialist comrades speaking about the riots ongoing. And then afterwards, there's going to be a social at the Institute bar. So that begins at 5.30, it's about a five minute walk away. Um, uh, and then you may have heard uh, over, uh, over the weekend about a worker summit that's happening on the 23rd of September. We are really encouraging people who have come to Marxism to sign up and take some leaflets, spread them around your work places. Um, I think it'll be a really good united uh, way to discuss how we fight, overcome the hospital ob obstacles in, in the fight uh, for fair pay and many other uh, uh, fights and, uh, and fight for the strikes to win. Um, and also, one final thing, the luggage room will be closing uh, during the closing rally, so it's important to pick up your luggage before the closing rally and take it with you. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, uh, you have 10 minutes. Thanks, Jean Dre, and thanks to everybody in spite. And apologies to those who couldn't speak. We have to rush for the, the final rally. Um, the person who spoke at the back, Rehad, for those who don't know him, is uh, a comrade who, amongst many other works, uh, made the fantastic film Miners Shot Down about the Marikana massacre, <coughs> which uh, I recommend to everybody to watch. It's an extraordinary film. But uh, one of the things about that, of course, is that it is about how an ANC government ends up presiding over the massacre of people on strike. And Cyril Ramaphosa, the man who had been the leader of the National Union of Mine Workers during the fight against apartheid, was the person who was a non-executive director of Longmin the company which, alongside the state, organised the massacre of striking miners. Now that inc that's an incredible turnaround. The ANC, the African National Congress, was not always a set-out organisation. It endured torture, amazing courage of the militants involved in it, the hangman's noose, Nelson Mandela didn't crack in prison, and yet, it accepted the terms of working within the system when it became to office. And it ends up in that appalling situation of poverty remaining, of homelessness remaining, of racism remaining inside South Africa. Indeed, it's an appalling indictment that poverty may be even worse than it was during the time of apartheid and shooting down strikers. Now that's a lesson which is brilliantly shown in Rihad's film. But also this isn't just a European phenomenon. I could have spoken about South America as well. What's happened in Chile with Boric, the, uh, the, the man elected again on the tide, a wave of uh, resistance from below. And yet now doing nothing to support the ordinary people in Chilean society. So that, this, is, this matters about uh, the scale of, of which we see it. The question that Paul raised, I think it was, what would you do if peace and justice became uh, a party? Would the Socialist Workers' Party uh, become, uh, join it? Um, I don't know. And that's a fudge. But I don't know because you have to say what's involved in those sorts of questions. You see, if they said, 
uh, the Socialist Workers' Party can affiliate and be part of it and can organise and can organise its own meetings and you can still produce socialist worker and so on, we'd have to consider it, wouldn't we? You know, the SWP doesn't think, I mean, it's fantastic. I think 165 people have joined the Socialist Workers' Party this weekend. It's fantastic. Uh, I'm really glad about that. Uh, but I don't think that the Socialist Workers' Party will become a mass organisation simply through having more events like this and getting 50 people here and 100 people there and so on, the rest of it. Uh, it will involve a whole number of splits and fusions uh, inside Socialist Organisations. Bits of the Labour Party will break off and join with us. Even, you think, of the, even after the Russian Revolution, it's not true that the communist parties throughout the world grew simply through adding a few more members all the time. There were big splits inside uh, the mass organisations. Um, a member of the Communist Party spoke for four hours in a foreign language to the Congress of the German Social Democrats and broke them, a third of them off, to join the Communist Party. There's a, uh, a, a test uh, for all of us about whether we're ready to do that. You know, that's... Though that's, that's the reality. We're not the finished article. We're not the fi you know, there will be huge amounts of churn on the left in Britain and internationally about it. But I don't know whether peace and justice may be that if it became a party. Or whether it's simply a trap. Whether it says to you, you're allowed to join it, but you can't organise, you have to stop being revolutionaries, you have to stop producing your propaganda, you have to, in other words, become Labour Party members with a slightly different shell around it. And then we're not interested in that, to be quite honest. We're not going to become involved with that sort of project. And that's why I say, when we support those people, we will do it as an independent revolutionary detachment. The question of that the Norwegian comrade uh, raised. You see, I, I, I don't agree that if you have revolutionary parties that you therefore become cut off from the movement. I know she wasn't saying that. But it's very important to say that, of course you can, but you can be a sectarian. You can say, I'm a revolutionary, I want nothing to do with the rest of you because you're not pure. Uh, you know, I don't want to fight against the fascists with you because you don't realise that unless we get rid of capitalism, there'll always be racism. And therefore, until you understand that we have to get rid of capitalism in order to get rid of racism, I'm not prepared to be on the streets with you. Or I'm not prepared to uh, be part of a strike until you realise that we have to overcome wage slavery and not just get better wages. You know. That is sectarianism, uh, and that's the complete antithesis of what we stand for. There's a big movement out there of which we are part. The anti-racist movement, the anti-war movement, the movement in defence of women's rights, the movement against transphobia, and so on. And most importantly, in some senses, the movement that workers are involved in fighting back economically in the strikes and so on at the moment. Very, very important for us. We're part of that movement. We're not cut off from it at all. The point is, what politics do you take into that movement? You can be part of much bigger things, but our insistence is that you don't hide your politics when you do so. You can't tell people lies. You can't, I mean, no one, no one presumably would say this, but you can't go to people who are fighting for abortion rights and tell them, if only Keir Starmer got in, everything would be wonderful. You can't tell a striking nurse, if only you voted for Keir Starmer, the question of the crisis in the health service would be solved. It's a lie, it's a political lie to tell people those sorts of things. And therefore, we should be part of the movement, but we should be part of the movement with a particular message. The comrade Dodo, who asked about, you can change things with the stroke of a pen. You can, of course. We have to recognize, though, that firstly, reforms are generally an expression of a movement from below. That you get change in Parliament because of the fact that there have been movements on the streets and the workplaces. Think about the actually very limited reforms that have been in the United States of America around the questions of racism. They came about because people fought, not inside the Congress, but people fought outside the Congress. 
The other problem is reforms can always be taken back. When I was a student, I went to university in 1975, uh, because there had been a huge level of resistance in, in society, the, the highest level of working class resistance there had been for a long time in the early 1970s in Britain, the notion of paying fees to go to university was ridiculous. Uh, not only did we not pay fees, they gave us large grants to go to university. And in the holidays, you could sign on for Social Security to get some more money as well. I mean, this was, and it didn't seem ex ex re re amazing at all. Uh, but they took it all back, didn't they? They took it all back. Roe v. Wade came about in the United States of America, the, the, at least the beginnings of abortion rights in America, because people fought on the streets, because women and men fought for abortion rights in America, and because of the explosion in American society. They took it back. And the only way we will defend abortion rights in America or in Britain is if we mobilise outside Parliament, not inside Parliament. And therefore, they can always take back reforms, and you get reforms when you fight. That's the reality about the situation. Elections matter, but they are not the key determinant of what happens in society. Final point, Com Chair, which is, it was very helpful of Liam to raise the question of the state, because I didn't have time to use a quotation about Corbyn. You see, one of the really interesting things about Corbyn was he did upset the state. He did upset the state. Actually, one of the questions about Palestine is because it's seen as a touchstone of imperialism. You know, if you have the, quote, wrong position on Palestine, in other words, you stand for Palestinian rights, you are seen as not signed up to the imperialist agenda about Zionism and about American imperialism in the Middle East, and therefore you have to be destroyed. And they were completely honest about it. Completely honest. Here we have... Uh, it has appeared in the Sunday Times and other places. A senior serving British Army general told the Sunday Times that if Corbyn became Prime Minister, this is, let me say it again because I said it quick, a senior serving British Army general, there would be mass resignations at all levels. You would face the very real prospect of an event which would effectively be a mutiny. You would see a major breaking convention with senior generals directly and publicly challenge Corbyn over vital, important policy decisions such as Trident, pulling out of NATO, and any plans to shrink the size of the armed forces. And so it goes on. The intelligence forces saying, we wouldn't give Corbyn information because he's too close to terrorists, by which they mean, you know, the Palestinians and so on. Now, there it is laid out in front of you. Now, the interesting thing about that, look at what the military were upset about, Trident and NATO. Corbyn gave in on the question of NATO. Corbyn gave in on the question of Trident because that pressure comes on you from the state. The irreformable capitalist state with the bodies of armed men at the centre of it, as Engels and Marx wrote. That's the real fist that lies behind the economic power as well. And always reformists of all stripes, of all of the examples that we've spoken about, collapse in the face of both the economic pressure and the pressure of the capitalist and imperialist state. That's what we're up against. But we do have power. We do have power of organising working class people together. We do have the power of the mass demonstration on the street and the riot and the occupation and the campaign. That's our power, and our crucial thing is to organise it. And if we've spoken about one thing over the period of Marxism, we have to have both a recognition of the danger of the threat that continuing capitalism poses to all of us and to the planet itself, but also a revolutionary optimism. I'm not for saying we can't win. We can win. We can win. The other side are ruthless and brutal. But if we use all of our power and all of our strength, it's possible for us to win. And I urge people at the end of all this to think about how our side organises. We are an organisation that wants to be part of every different campaign that takes place, but also to fight on the streets and in the workplaces for a vision of a fundamentally different sort of society. And that's why you should join the Socialist Workers.